What's happening people? Welcome back to Football Therapy with me, your host Jan, and welcome back to my guest show which is called Talking Chelsea, where me and a guest talk about Chelsea, funnily enough. Today I'm delighted to welcome George Benson, who's been on the podcast, big Chelsea fan and YouTuber, to discuss what's going on at the bridge and just generally Chelsea. So George, how you doing mate? Very good, mate. Feeling a little bit worse for wear today after uh, yesterday's mm. events. Went to Megan's Cafe up the street from Stamford Bridge. Had a couple of uh, strayers in there and then that deep slightly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you need to be on this stuff then, mate. Mm. Absolutely. I've got, well, it's actually now like there's nothing in there, but I'm on the water today. You're on the right track, man. All right, so we need to get into it. Chelsea. Um, it's such a weird, like, situation, isn't it? Because, obviously, the feel-good fact is strong. The players are... Looks like they're all into Frank Lampard. They're completely buying into his project. They all really want to play for Chelsea. And this team, you know, people on the bench are happy. People on the field are happy. The coaching staff's all in. There's no... Uh, evidence of any rifts the communication's good between everyone at the club which is a rarity at Stamford Bridge but there's issues and I want to get your thoughts on it mate but I did a video today and I made comparisons to um I want to get your thoughts on this as well I made comparisons to Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool early doors how he wanted to play his heavy metal football Gengen press but it was really entertaining at times but they showed massive vulnerabilities so do you feel like the feel good factor is strong enough to just hold Chelsea out for a long time and do you also see similarities with early Liverpool well early Klopp's Liverpool I think the difference between Chelsea and Liverpool is when Klopp took over at Liverpool there wasn't really any realistic expectation of immediately challenging for a title Whereas with Chelsea, we've kind of got like this this bounce back effect where we just sack a manager and then win the league, sack a manager, then win the league, goes wrong, win the league. So expectations for us are always that we have to be challenging. So in terms of how much time we can offer to give a manager as a collective fan base, not just as a fan base, but as the board as well, it's difficult to know whether or not the conversations that have been had with Frank are that despite it being Chelsea and despite the way that the trajectory has gone over the past, say, 20 years, we're not expecting you to win the league for the next three or four seasons. So with that being said, you've got all of the time to be able to go and imprint what it is you're trying to do that we also agree on. Otherwise, we wouldn't have given you the job in the mm. first place. So I do agree to an extent that it could be very similar to the early Klopp days in that respect. It all depends on whether that conversation's been had or what Frank knows are the expectations of the club. Because at the end of the day, if we're talking five games down the line that nothing's really changed, we've got a couple of good performances, but we're 14th mm. in the table, like how long is it going to be before you and I or people in the comments of our videos are like, well, this isn't good enough. Like we can't, we can't sit through this mm. any longer. So yeah. I don't know, but I'm, for giving time I've always I've said for years how like as a fan my dream is to see like it's not, it doesn't happen in football anymore but like a, a Sir Alex Ferguson mm. dynasty type thing yeah. and if this is ever going to happen it, it has to be with Frank Lampard as Chelsea manager well, that's surely it, that's how I felt the narrative that I was terrified and elated at the prospect of Lamps coming home but um so yeah the few things you said there man like firstly <sighs> The, the, let's be real, like the, the Chelsea fans should give him time one way or another. But no matter what, pre-season, everyone was like, oh yeah, we'll give him loads of time. But that's a very, very different situation once things get going and the results turn bad. You know, first off, it will start with the bookies turning on him. You know, it will be the bookies like, oh, results, yeah. Yeah, negative results, Chelsea. That's only one thing to do there. But, you know, what is... What, it, what is a realistic... Um, expectation of Frank Lampard do you think like what do you think is a fair expectation of the fans and from the club's perspective because I guess that's like two different questions don't you think I think it is and if we're looking again at what we did last year at times it didn't look like we were going to finish in the top four and then we always had Europa League football as that gateway into the Champions mm -hmm. League I, for one, have always said that if you're going to say, oh, I want to finish in the top six, I want to finish in a European place, you'd be foolish to not 
aim the sights at the top four. So I think as Chelsea, for a start, just on a base layer, there's always got to be the expectation of playing in the Champions mm-hmm. League because we won the competition in 2012. We've been competing very well in the competition since like 2003, 2004. So for me, this season, we if we finish top six, I think we'd have done okay. And uh, But at the same time, I also stick with that argument where if you're going to aim for the top six, you've got to go for the top four. And if we get the top four, particularly after what we've seen in terms of like the quality of the competition, mm. United obviously played tonight. They were very good against us. They're looking better. You've got Liverpool, who are different gravy. Man City are in a league of their own in terms of like the quality of team that they've got. Mm. Spurs look very good as well with Pochettino as their manager they're always going to be they're always going to do very well and so do Arsenal so immediately there's four teams there five teams teams there that you could say Mm. are actually better than we are at this point so if we're going with that it's like well top six would be a success yeah also right I know what you say about it's a good salient point about for Chelsea and the you know, the, how good Chelsea are, or certainly how good they've been in Europe over the last 10 odd years, that you have to be going for the top four place. But top four, at risk of sounding like a sort of generic TV pundit, but top four isn't what it used to be. Chelsea used to be one of these, like, quite comfortably top four sides. But not only is it no longer easier, as easy rather, to be one of those comfortable top four sides. There is the Liverpool and City, which are a shoe in They're like, right, well, we'll just discount those. Two spots are gone. You know, like, that's not even up for, like, debate. So two spots are gone. And it is, like, three, four of you going for two spots. And now look at teams like Leicester, who I've said all pre-season, I think, are going to be, like, massively threatening to the top six. So really, the, the 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 game's done changed. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a it's a yeah. different situation now. So yeah, that's what I that's what I'm wondering. I wonder when he had when Frank Lampard, you know, agreed to be Chelsea manager, and he stayed up to what was it one a.m. at Stamford Bridge before he left, and he probably had loads of conversations before he signed the contract. I wonder if they said, "Look, it, we'd like you to get top four. We want you to do this." But for me. It's about bringing back a feel-good factor, a belief through the club, and they obviously have a, lot, a, a long time wanted to bring the pathway through from the academy. Certainly Roman has. Now, all of that looks like it could be the case, and it could be coming in. It could be positive. So I want to get your take and thoughts on what looks like um, positive intent and aggressive, entertaining football. Because I maintain, even though... Leicester had loads of chances in that second half um, and generally up and down uh, throughout the 90, any team could have won that game against Leicester at Stamford Bridge for the first 20 minutes. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is a, it's tenable to continue that for 90 minutes, but for the first 20 minutes, Chelsea looked like peak Barcelona <laughs> against Leicester. <laughs> I mean, so do, would you agree with the, the intent and the style and the application that's what we were missing and that's all there like maybe the rest could be ironed out with coaching yeah well if you take Maurizio Sarri for example there were times last season when we played some really beautiful football and all of these flip everybody shared on social media like oh look what Chelsea are going to do now Mm. Uh, we didn't see that but the results were still pretty good we won the Europa League Carabao Cup final third place like that is a success Mm. ride it off move on with this I think that again we're always going to compare what we're seeing to what we see from other teams because at the end of the day that's what football is you're comparing your position in the league you're comparing you know how excited you are compared to how excited Man City fans are under Pep Guardiola so for me, looking at what Frank's vision is, like you said, for 20 minutes yesterday, we looked like peak Barcelona. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. It's a bold statement <laughs> to make, but like we've played some incredible football. And we're talking about Mason Mount. He's playing his first game at Stamford Bridge, scoring that goal. And it was a great goal. It wasn't a scrappy little finish that anyone could have done if they are in the right place at the right time. There are, there are real signs that everything we've wanted to see from our Chelsea team that go out on the pitch, is actually coming. The only downside, and unfortunately in football, it's the biggest downside of them all, is it's not getting results right now. Mm. But there's only been two games. So I think in terms of, like you said, in terms of having an imprint 
and a, a vision and a long-term DNA that Frank is trying to bring to Chelsea Football Club, all of the early signs are nothing but mm. good, in my opinion. Despite the results, which, again, we can't run away from that. It's like football is based on results. The money that you make is determined by the results you get. The money then you make from those results depends on how you strengthen in the future. So everything is relative, but I like the direction. And I think that, again, with you mentioned coaching. Coaching and fitness. If we're going to play this high intensity, those players have got to get fitter. Mm. Because you know we're not going to win football matches by playing minutes and then slopping around for 70 mm, yeah it's a good point and even if like you are going to go for that even a little bit the opening 20 minutes you got to kill the game if you're like right we're going to slap them about break their confidence because a really interesting thing that uh, Lampard came out with said is he said obviously Chelsea can't carry on playing like that in terms of just it, they just make themselves vulnerable but he says look we've got to break their confidence because they came out in that second half and they were like we are absolutely still in this game um let's show that and then they grow in confidence and the whole complexion of the game changes so I think he was trying to assert the sort of message that look we're trying to break them we're trying to break them early doors and then we're going to use our professionalism to see out the game which is fair enough I wouldn't uh, subscribe to that being his long term tactic for every game but maybe he thought a team like Leicester the feel good factor he could squash him two, two or three goals in the first half and then sort of try and play possession but instead Chelsea became erratic, nervous, uh, lost their sharpness, and then came the misplaced passes, the space in be- behind, and all that sort of luck. So, so maybe, I mean, obviously the next game's Norwich. Chelsea just, like you say, I agree with you. We, we're both on the same page in terms of the right, you know, evidence is there of a whole positive shift. But no matter how positive that shift is, if, Chelsea don't win against Norwich and still can't put a, a win on the board, then um, then there will be serious problems. But um, I want to get uh, your thoughts on some personnel as well, George. Um, I was going to put a blunt question to you. Striker, who are you going with? Who's your first choice? Or who would you try next? Um, Mishy Batshuayi. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, but Giroud didn't offer me anywhere near enough yesterday for me to be able to say yep that's my starting striker for the Premier League this season he just didn't I've said it every single time I mention Olivier Giroud I either mention how brilliant his heel was and I watched your video yesterday and you even acknowledged that which is great it's, it's great but like that it's not it's not mm. good enough it is not good enough for again if we bring it back to this conversation of like where do we finish where do we want to finish where will we finish Giroud is not going to fire us into the top four mm. he's just not and I, Tammy, again, I, I support him. I back him the same way everybody does at Chelsea. But again, I'm still on the fence. He can do it. And then there's Mishy. Like, it, it, at the end of the day, I'm kind of saying it because it's a fullback. I'm not saying that Mishy Bajuai is the best striker we've ever had and he's going he's gonna to win us the Premier League. But we've only got three options. And he's the only one who's not even made the flipping mm-hmm. bench. And so far, we've scored one goal in 180 minutes of Premier League football. And there are nothing but question marks still. So, surely, you just have to give him a go because you don't, you can't do anything else. Mm. And it's not like... I think, okay, so there's two things to talk about with Batshuayi. I think he's a, he's a superb finisher. There's a school of thought that he's maybe even the best finisher at the club still. But, you know, like we saw... That goal he scored in pre-season, one of the, I think the second goal in pre-season, where he only came on for like 10, 15 minutes or whatever it was. He gets the ball, people are like trying to defend in front of him. He does really well to retain possession, and then he rifles the shot on the top of the net. And you're like, superb, that's what we need. And obviously there's a recurring theme of coaches not fancying him at Chelsea, because maybe... Is, uh, the, the theory I've heard is information retention or tactical instruction retention or whatever and therefore that's a huge concern for a coach and you want to leave him out and then you've got people like Tammy Abraham who's like you know a young English lad who completely can communicate with him on a top level taking all the tactical instruction make the runs you know basically say yes Gaffer I can do all of that and then you've got Olivier Giroud who like you say often underwhelming but is really experience in the Premier League and has scored important goals. I mean, he scored in two European finals for us in recent 
you know, in the recent months. Um, but it's not enough. Like you say, we need goals. We need a goal scorer now. We don't need Giroud to turn up in the big emotionally charged cup final. We need someone who's just going to bang goals against Leicester and Norwich uh, in the Premier League. Yeah. You know, and maybe that's Michy Batshuayi. Um, you know, there's a point where at least bring him on as a sub. Like if the tactical instruction or the plans are going well and you're just getting the ball forward, surely he's a sniffer, isn't he? So... So, he is. You could call him the sniffer dog instead yeah, of the bat. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Well, but, you know, whatever the hell we're going to call him, just get him on the pitch and we could try and uh, score some goals. At least put him on the bench. Was he not on the bench? Like, he hasn't been given any chance. Like, zero percent mm. chance, Michi. How can you write... Whether And I agree with you. I definitely think it's an element of Frank tells him something... And then it's like when you tell the kid not to go in the sweet drawer before 5 p.m. And then the kid's in the sweet drawer at 3 o'clock. It's like, I've told you something. Mm. You're not doing it. And I'm the manager and you're the player. And if you're not going to do it, mm. he will. Therefore, you're not in my team. Mm. But one goal in two games. It's so weird, isn't it? It's a recurring theme. It's one of those situations where if you, you might be reluctant but you maybe just have to do it. Like, interestingly, apparently, like, <clears throat> on a minor tangent, Eden Hazard carried Chelsea last season on his back, and he had the best season he's ever had at Chelsea. But there's an, there's a quite a compelling argument to be made why he was one of the main factors why Sari Ball didn't work at Chelsea. Um, because, not just because the way he played, because he didn't really play the Sari Ball system, he just sort of, did his own thing, was an excellent and played really well, which is that Bissari had to weigh up. He's like, right, well, he's making my footballing philosophy not work. But at the same time, he's carrying this season to a result under my reign. So I can't not have him. And, he, you know, he did never dispute his absolute immense quality. Um, you know, there's a school of thought if, if Chelsea didn't have Eden Hazard, but had a good player in that position, but better players in other position for Sarri's football, it would have worked better. But anyway, that's obviously an extreme example in tangent, but maybe Lampard needs to look and say, look, right, when Batch is on the pitch, I don't get these particular combinations or movements in an offensive phase because he's a little bit dim at times. But I tell you what, if we're going to be just playing balls in the box and doing cutbacks, I need someone who's strong and confident to just put balls away. Maybe... He's, he's just just play him but um oh, oh, to, to move on to another point as well mate i want to ask you if this ban is lifted in january maybe not i want to ask you the theoreticals what place are you looking to strengthen is it striker what does that mean for tammy and Giroud? you know at batch as well does it mean all three of them are, are going to be downhearted do you think there's anywhere else on the pitch we need to strengthen um, and theoretically answer that question for maybe January or would you wait, save all the money and go all in in the summer? I'm saying January if the ban gets reduced, by the way. Okay, I think that if we want to spend as little money as possible and get an immediate answer to an immediate issue, I would go and buy, put all of our efforts into buying Sergio Aguero. Wow. Because he... He's arguably, well, I, I wouldn't even say it's an argument, top four Premier League strikers ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's one of the... He's still this... so yeah. good. He's so good. Yeah. And if he's unhappy at Man City, a team where they could literally field three different 11s and win the league on their mm -hmm. own, like, you, n the, nobody can say that they didn't see that there's clearly some tensions between him mm -hmm. and Pep. Like, Gabriel Jesus is a very good player. Maybe Pep's saying, actually, mate, you're not number one here anymore, despite everything you've done for this football club. Yet Aguero could walk into, mm, maybe not Liverpool, any other team in the, in the mm. league and start 38 mm. games. And yeah, he's had a few injury issues, but look at his record. Mm. If Aguero didn't have the injuries that he's had, imagine the goals he would have scored. What would that mean for Michy, Tammy and Olivier Giroud? Well, at the end of the day, they know what their job mm. is. They know what they're getting paid to do. They're getting paid to score goals. And if they're not going to do that, Sergio Aguero, 120% mm. will. That's a... And I think it's a player that is pos it's possible for us to sign him. I mm. do believe that. I don't think City would be worried about selling him to mm. Chelsea. I really yeah, don't. It's interesting. It's, it's You're not the first person. Who's... However, he goes for them would based on whether we could or couldn't even go for him. Yeah. But that's my... Well, 
I just want to pick up on that because you're not the first Chelsea fan that said about Sergio Aguero and both times you hear it and you're like, whoa, hot take. But then you talk about it and you're like, yeah, you know, maybe because he's 30 now. Um, and, you know, Chelsea, he's got to have at least two years of plus 20, 24, five goals of league goals in him. And he, since he's played under Pep Guardiola, his work rate is a lot better. So you could argue that would suit Lampard a little bit because he likes people to run. But... um yeah, I mean, it's something like that, because you're, you're, you're right, I, I still think Aguero is underrated, I think he's absolutely in the elite all-time English, not English, strikers in English football, so yeah, something like that would be yeah. lovely, especially when people are, you know, you take so many risks on these, like, European strikers that come to the Premier League, and, you know, just don't, just don't do it, and then if you... With Sergio Aguero, you get two seasons of absolute gold out of him, like, guaranteed, so, yeah. So, what about any, anywhere else on the pitch, George? Because um, people were saying left back, but Emerson is looking better and better for me. So, yeah, Emerson for me. Like I saw your tweet about his statistics yesterday. Yeah. He was in his in his own right. He played a flawless game of football with with what he did. Hundred mm. yeah. percent tackles was it? Hundred percent clearances and yeah. everything was good. Everything, yeah. And he he does me more and more every week. And mm. I think that if we're prioritizing money, we might not be able to be as frugal as we've once been, or competitive with the likes of Man City or probably Man United as well. So if I had to prioritise another position, I... This is a hard one. I would probably just say we have to buy another world-class centre-back. Like a world-class, already like at the top of the game centre-back. Mm. Like a Koulibaly. Mm. From, yeah, I would go for him. Yeah, Koulibaly, I I absolutely loved him. Like I still do, but a couple of years ago, I was like, wow. But again, he's 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 what's he twenty nine, twenty eight, about to touch twenty nine. So a couple of years, like it's again, it, it's with someone like Sergio Aguero. Yeah, you see, like you said, City and Pep might actually sign him if they can get like fifty million for him. They might be like, you know what, Jesus is here. He's in his thirties, fifty million. Maybe he hasn't got long left on his contract, Aguero. I'm not sure. Um, and you can make a deal. Certainly something that's not astronomically high. But Koulibaly will be an £100 million centre-back. Um, and for a guy who's only just a tiny bit younger and a centre-back, I just feel like... <laughs> my, my issue is, I get what you're saying. A real world-class centre-back, someone who could, like, a, a commanding type, and Koulibaly would be that. The kind of guy I always say that, Level it's like, it sounds a bit video gamey, but like levels up the guy next to him, you know, like the JT effect, like the JT yeah. effect. Like certainly Van Dyke does that, um, and he would be there. And like, but the thing is, for me, my concern with Lampard and his football at the moment ne- doesn't necessarily. F- I don't think our centre backs are that bad. I feel like I know United bought Maguire now, but if you, I don't think there's a million miles difference between. Well, I feel like Chelsea got better defence than Arsenal. I feel like Chelsea still probably have a better defence. Well, no, not now they've got wan Saka. But they've they've got a good defence. Spurs' defence is okay, but I feel like with Zuma, Christensen, Tamori, um, Rudiger, they're good players, you know, and they're good, strong options. And with Emerson at the left back and Rich James at right back, I feel like the, the, the personnel of the back line not, isn't necessarily the problem. It's the tactical approach, the counter-attacks, the space between the lines, the, the midfield. There you go, just come through. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that. That, that seems to be that that yeah. for me is the problem but i kind of feel like okay so this is a good question that i was thinking of and talking about in my video today actually do you think there's a tactical naivety to lampard and if there is that's okay surely isn't it because this is his second year in management or is he not allowed to have that because of the type of job it is 100%. But with a tactical naivety will come a moment where people will herald him a world-class manager if he beats one of the big mm. teams. Because you could say, okay, there's a tactical naivety, but at the same time, it's very clear that he does have a very clear way that he wants his teams to play football. So in the same sentence, you could say, well, okay, maybe it's naive to think that this one way is going to is going to win you games against very good opposition in the Premier League, for example, Leicester City. But I completely agree with you. If that is the case, then 100% it's okay. Mm. We can't go and say, oh, no, Frank Lampard, tactically Mm. naive. No, No. get rid of it. You can't do that when you've had Ancelotti, Sarri, 
Conti, Jose Mourinho, like no, that argument is never gonna is never gonna sit yeah. with me as a Chelsea fan anymore. We've had some of the most tactically gifted, some of the most emotional managers. We, we've had everything we could mm. have had, everything in world football. There's no one else really okay to Dan, mm. but I mean, you could even say that he could still be tactically naive. He's just had great players that he's yeah, worked with. That. Like that for me, that conversation shouldn't shouldn't exist. But I can understand why someone would say that but for me you have to just trust in him and I, I think it's at the same time yes he managed Derby and he didn't even get them up to the Premier League he didn't even get Derby promoted from the Championship but there were, there were seven or eight teams better mm. than Derby mm. last season in the Championship I didn't watch too much of the football from, but from what I can see on paper there are far better teams mm. than Derby and when I championship sides play Derby played some of the best football mm. in my opinion yeah. so we're already seeing good, good football from mm. Frank at Chelsea. We are. It's clinical finishing and that striker thing that we spoke about throughout this entire entire video today, that is clearly where the issue lies right now. Mm. Like yesterday, we created chances. If we just scored two more, I know this is all hypothetical, but we're talking about 3-1 win. Mm. No one's asking questions about Frank Lampard's tactical naivety then. Yeah. Like, I think that small things at Chelsea that are actually big, really, but it could be a small thing that if we just like change it around, move things around, we could still be talking about a team who could finish in the top four. I'm not writing it off. No, and you shouldn't. And that's a good point that you made. Well, talking about a free one win if you put those chances away. And to be honest, going back on what I said at the beginning of this uh, show about what Frank Lampard says, if that is 3-0 up early doors, then they don't have that rallying spirit, the opposition. Maybe they don't score that goal, you know? Maybe the goal doesn't come from an Ndidi mistake and he feels he needs to go straight up Super Saiyan in the opposition box to make up for his mistake. Do you know what, yeah. I, mean? Do you know what I mean? So there, there is a lot of that. And just on Derby as well, I've... I've I've spoken to some Derby fans. Apparently, they did play really positive football, but the rebuild that Lampard did um, at Derby with bringing in the youngsters and changing the style of play to attacking, so technically they did slightly better than the season before because they got to the playoff final. Um, but, you know, everyone's saying, oh, they finished six before, they finished six this time, like, maybe even like a point less than before. But actually, if you take into consideration and the context of the rebuild he did and the style of play he did, he was actually massively ahead of schedule in terms of the positives for that Derby side. So maybe a little bit of that um, needs to come come with Chelsea as well but I reckon um I reckon this is a good point to wrap it up George we've we've definitely dissected uh, a lot of the concerns I think for Chelsea Frank Lampard we talked about the Leicester result but um yeah I mean are you generally to you're feeling positive you feel like we've got enough to take out of it to sort of have good vibes rather than bad on the whole I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever been, even now, like one point, I don't think I've ever been as excited to be a fan of Chelsea, or football actually, than at the moment. Because if we're talking about like the Premier League, we've had the two Champions League finalists last year, the two Europa League finalists, the quality in the Premier League is as good now as it's mm. ever been. I think, again, it's a typical Chelsea thing where if you're not a fan of Chelsea Football Club, you are excited to see Chelsea get bad results. And through excitement from other teams' fans, it means we get more negative media attention because that's what people mm. want to hear. So for us, I think as long as we are seeing the effort on the pitch that we have definitely seen despite not winning any of these first three games, I'm 100% still in the optimistic bandwagon. I'm going to go to Norwich next uh, Saturday, I think it is. I hope it's Saturday. Saturday because I've planned to go away on Saturday. <laughs> if I turn up to Carrow Road on Sunday and the game's done, I'm going to be a bit, bit miffed, but... No, I'm still buzzing, mate. You know, it's like it's Monday and I'm I'm sat here in my flipping new Chelsea hoodie and I'm just like, damn it, we've got to wait another five or six days for a game. Which uh it's always been a bit like that, but it feels feels more now, I think. Because yeah. I feel like everyone's on the same page. And we all want the same yeah. thing and I think that what we've wanted for so long, we're finally seeing it. It's just gonna be a patient waiting game as to the conversion of results for that. Box office, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> you heard it there from George Benson. He puts it in such a great way. And that kind of led on to what you were saying just before in terms of people wanting Chelsea to fail. It's all happening, the emotion, the boys back. It's just straight up box office, as it always is at Chelsea. But you're right, man. But George, thank you so much for coming on, man. Um, I'd urge everyone to go check out George's 
YouTube channel, if you haven't already, George Benson Football, where it's predominantly Chelsea. Isn't that right, George? Yeah, 80%. I did a poll and then I'm sticking to that kind of kind of trend. 80% Chelsea. <laughs> not 100% Chelsea. Not a, yeah, not one bit more. Um, cool, man. Well, thanks for coming on, bro. And uh, hopefully... Thank you very much for having me. This has been a good chat. We're going to have to meet up in person and do a video on my defo, channel soon too. Definitely, man. Next game I'll come to, we'll do that and we'll have a beer as well, George. You ain't so tough with that bad boy tuck. I'ma get it how I'm living. I'ma walk the walk. Outline my lines. I rap through thought. Body bag the verse. Outline the chuck. In my life seen trouble, hustle on the double Silence on the trigger like my pick got a muzzle Yo chick like to guzzle, bad boy stay in trouble I only love this paper, sorry I don't I love me,